So tonight I'm going to talk about Google Maps platform uh, and using it with DeckGL, which is an open source data visualization framework. Uh, really quick, my name is Alex. I'm also a developer advocate on the Maps team. Uh, this is my Twitter handle at the bottom. I realize fully that my name is very long and hard to spell. So you can universally find me online on Twitter and GitHub by looking for the angry little dog in the 18 pack of beer. That is my actual dog. Her name is Allie. And other than, other than uh, you know, coming out to, to meet other developers and talk about things that I think are cool, my other, my other goal in all of this is to humiliate her as much as possible all around the world. Uh, wait. So, uh, like, 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 uh, so you heard from Angela earlier tonight, who we're teammates. Uh, Mike is in the back of the room. He is our boss. So if you like, if you like the talk tonight, uh, go tell Mike that you like it. And tell, you know, my name is Alex. And if uh, <laughs> and if you don't like it, my name is Angela. And, <laughs> and you can find me on Twitter at Wangela. Cool. Oops. Woo. All right. So let's start with the conceit. Understanding data is hard. Uh, everyone here, I assume, is a web developer, right? And probably every single one of you has to work with data in some form or another every day. Probably like really large amounts of data, right? Uh, and it's difficult. Uh, as we deal with larger and larger data sets over time, which is the trend, uh, we have very little capacity as human beings to really parse the meaning of this data. This is even more true when we talk about geodata uh, because of this thing that's called the world, right? When we look at a data set of, ge of geodata, we're often looking at something like uh, you know, latitude and longitude points on a map, and it's really, uh, it, it's really very difficult. We have no way of mapping that data uh, mentally onto the world. So to just kind of get the point across, this is a gigantic array of a whole bunch of latitude and longitude points. Does anyone want to guess what this represents? Manchester. Manchester. Anyone else? Guesses? Pentagon. What's that? Pentagon. I'm sorry, one more time? Pentagon. The Pentagon? <laughs> <laughs> um, so you're all wrong. This data means absolutely nothing. <laughs> I generated this by smashing my, key, my hands on the number pad, o pad over and over until I got an array. Uh, and again, this is only to point out that we just like, we, we literally can't look at this and understand what's going on inside of this data set. And on top of that, up until now, right, basically what we've had is some form or another of the marker. And don't get me wrong, we're, we're, Ma we're Google Maps. We love the marker, right? The marker's done a lot for us over the years. Uh, you know, it's helped us find restaurants and gas stations and doing all these lovely things for, for you know, over a, dec over a decade now. But the, the reality of it is, OK, wait, one more time. I know Angela asked this earlier. Who's used the Maps API before? Cool. Who's tried to put more than two or 300 markers on the map? How did that go for you? <laughs> Thumbs down, right? So chances are, uh, probably not, not too well. The reality of the situation is our marker implementation starts to run into fairly significant performance issues once you get up to about two or 300 markers. Now, granted, the number of, the number of you know, cases where you need to put more than a few hundred markers on the map is you know, most people, they're going to be just fine, right? But uh, increasingly, as we, as we look at uh, more, modern, more modern web apps, right? we do things like analytics, whatever. Right? We're looking to actually visualize really large data sets on the web. So this is where DeckGL comes in. Like I mentioned, DeckGL is an open source data visualization framework. It was built by the fine engineering team over at, at Uber, who, as you can imagine, have an awful lot of geodata that they're trying to, to visualize and understand. Right? Uh, it's a WebGL-powered data visualization framework. Is everybody kind of familiar with WebGL? I can do like a quick primer on that. It's OK to raise your hand and say you're not. So, so, OK, cool. So WebGL is an open standard for, uh, for, that is built on top of OpenGL, right? And what it does is it allows us to access, the, to access the processing power of the GPU from inside the browser, right? Pretty straightforward. Um, so this is significant because it brings a whole lot more rendering capacity 
into, into the mix for when we're doing visualizations in the browser. Uh, also, primarily built for a geo or a mapping use case. Uh, that is not to say that's the only thing that you can do with DeckGL, but it is what it was primarily built for. Uh, next thing that's kind of of note is that it takes a layer-based approach to data, visu to data visualization. So as uh, I'll show a, a bunch of, of demos later on, and the way to think about it conceptually, right, is you are layering, uh, you're layering visualizations on top of the map, right? Uh, and then last of all, gives us a whole bunch of really beautiful visualizations right out of the box. Uh, now, I don't know if anyone here has tried to uh, write WebGL before, but it is like, it's like really hard, really hard. Um, I am not smart enough to write WebGL. If you've ever looked at the amount of code it takes to create a spinning box with WebGL, it's like daunting. Uh, and I wouldn't recommend it for anyone. But wait, there's more. So also, DeckGL, as I mentioned before, brings support for really, 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 really large data sets. Uh, so right, right now, the markers start to run up against performance issues if you're talking about two or 300. The largest data set that last time I checked was managed to performantly visualize on top of a Google map with DeckGL was 6 million. So pretty big increase. Uh, also, it brings a bunch of very nice, uh, very nice features to us, such as automatic handling of things like animations and resizing. Uh, animation or uh, resizing, that's one that is really interesting to me because it's something that a lot of people don't really think about sometimes when they're on the map. But if you have, for example, pins on a map and the user is zooming in and zooming out, right? You probably want those to scale relatively. Otherwise, you're going to end up with like really weird UI effects. Uh, and then last of all, supports custom layers. Like I said, so if, if you do fancy yourself the kind of person that can, that can write WebGL, you can totally use the, the WebGL context inside of DeckGL and build something from scratch. Again, I wouldn't recommend it personally for your sanity. Uh, uh, but you can also uh, subclass any of the existing uh, visualization layers that are available in DeckGL as well. And this is something that a lot of people do. And we announced initial support in the JavaScript API at I.O. this year. Uh, not going not gonna to lie, kind of had a couple beers and discovered the transition effects inside of Keynote. So <laughs> that's, why, that's why the fireworks. I mean, it's a big deal, but you know. Uh, so we were, at I.O., we announced uh, initial support for the JS, a, for the JS API. Uh, so not 100% of the feature set of DeckGL is currently supported. But for, on, for most purposes, it's going to be everything that, that you need. Uh, and also, it's awesome. I promise that's the last like, transition animation that I'll show you. <laughs> uh, so this, not the kitty, the thing behind the kitty, uh, is a, what's called a scatter plot visualization. And it's just a bunch of dots on the map, right? And this data represents, uh, it's from an open data set by the city of Paris. And it's all of the street trees in Paris, their locations and their types. Uh, and the different coloring represents a different type of tree. So this is really interesting, right? Because other than kind of just like looking pretty, uh, and like I like pretty things, uh, it, it tells you something about a place, right? When you can visualize data at this scale within the context of the world uh, where, where it actually lives. So you can, you can see uh, insights into the data, right? You can get a view of like what city planners were thinking, uh, all kinds of things. So it's pretty awesome. And a lot of people, right, the next question is, okay, so how does it work? And you're all JavaScript developers here, so I know that you're going to love this. And my answer is, who cares? <laughs> like, it's awesome. <laughs> uh, one of the great things about frameworks is that we, is that it brings us a lot of functionality and we don't have to really worry about the guts of the implementation uh, and, and all, of that, all of that added complication. But let's talk a little bit about how it works. So WebGL, the way that it, the way that it inserts into its context into the DOM is it takes advantage of the Canvas element, right? Everyone's familiar with the Canvas element, usually through use of the Canvas API. In this case, the Canvas API isn't being used it's uh, the canvas element is, is injected into the DOM. The WebGL context is inserted there, and that's where 
all of the rendering hap all of the GPU rendering is then visualized inside of whatever you know web app or web page that you have. Uh, in terms of how it makes that work inside of Google Maps, our JS API has a class called Overlay View. Overlay View has been used for many many things over the years, uh, particularly as a way for developers to draw in different ways on the map. Uh, and the way to think about it is imagine you have a transparent layer that sits right on top of the base map and then syncs with its movements, right? Uh, because turns out if you put something, if you put a data visualization on the map, you probably want it to move with the map because your user does not come to your website and just like say, ooh, pretty, pretty map, and then go away. Uh, they want to interact with the map. Uh, and then the last thing of note is DeckGL uh, adopts a reactive programming model. So this is mainly for performance reasons. And one of the demos that I'll show a little bit later on uh, will kind of uh, give you a little bit more of an understanding of this. So very, before I get going, these are a couple links. This one on top goes to a app that I have running in App Engine that shows like a live demo of all of the different uh, layers that I'm going to talk to you about tonight. And then this bottom link goes to the source. So two things. Number one is these pull down really large data sets. So if you are on the Wi-Fi, please do not 50 people in this room. I'll try to go to this link right now. <laughs> <laughs> one, of the, one of the really serious pitfalls with demoing something that is made to work with extremely large data sets is it's also extremely good at, br at breaking Wi-Fi. <laughs> so uh, go later. Check it out later when you're at home. Uh, also, the second thing that I always like to point out, and, and uh, Angela had mentioned this as well, is you'll notice these links are goo.gle. Uh, Google has spent the last 10 years training us on goo.gl short links. 10 years of research and development, we got the E. How about it? <laughs> <laughs> so just keep that in mind uh, if, you're, if you're writing these down, because I cannot be held responsible for where goo.gl slash deckgl demos takes you. I don't know. All right, so let's look at how it actually works. So I have a few different things to show. Uh, the first is, so let's look at a pretty simple app. So we have some imports. The first thing is this Google Maps overlay class from DeckGL. And this is the, when we instantiate this class, this is what creates an instance of overlay view and allows us to put on the map, generates the WebGL context, inserts that DeckGL context into Canvas, puts it in the overlay view, okay? Oops. The next thing is, I'm importing a few different uh, visualization layers from DeckGL as well. So these are those out of the box, really nice looking visualizations I told you about. And then some map styles to make my, my map look pretty uh, because pretty maps are great. And uh, Angela had gone into this a little bit earlier. I just always like to point out that the, is that, uh, the JSON blob that styles the map is this very long and very ugly uh, JSON object because the amount, the number of different customizations you can do to the map is very large, right? Uh, so highly recommend that you do not write this by hand and instead use that styling wizard that uh, Angela had pointed you to before. Cool. Next thing, we have just an index.html file. Pretty simple. I assume that if you're at this meetup, you can read this. Uh, <laughs> so really, really basic HTML template. We have the classic div id equals maps, or equals map, right? So anyone who's used the maps JavaScript API has probably done this before. Uh, this is just the div where we, where we in, inject the iframe that shows the map into the DOM. And then I import this app.js script where all of the application logic is happening. So in the app.js file, continuing on, I have a few different data sources. So these are just uh, REST APIs that are exposed by different open data projects from different cities in the world. In this case, uh, Chicago, New York City, and Los Angeles. If you're ever interested in playing with GeoData or DeckGL, I highly recommend that you Google open data city of your choice. Uh, because just about every major city in the world now has some sort of open data program, and they put out all kinds of really interesting stuff. Uh, it's, a, it's a really cool way to learn all sorts of things about places. The next thing is I have this script which just loads the map. JS API, probably if you've used the JS API before, you've followed one of our code samples and you see the whole like script tag and script tag that uh, has you know async source equals googleapis.com slash blah, blah, blah. Uh, in this case, 
I'm just, insert, I'm just inserting that script tag dynamically so that I can promiseify it, right? Because DeckGL relies on the maps.js API to load. So I need to ensure that it's loaded, right? From my JavaScript code. Next, I have, I have a function for initializing the map. So various settings for when the map loads, like the map the, where the map is going to be centered. Uh, I have a different zoom depending on which city I'm looking at because the part of the thing about doing data visualizations, right, or any kind of visualization or any kind of UI really, right, is you want to frame the, you want to frame the UI in a way that is going to kind of be the, the most effective. I load the map script and then I initialize the map. Pretty straightforward. And down here is where I actually run it. So I'm doing that map initialization, and then I'm, and then I'm instantiating Google Maps overlay. So on its own, all this is doing, again, is inserting that canvas element that has the WebGL context, putting it into overlay view. Right? Now, there's a number of different properties that can be passed uh, to the Google Maps overlay when you, when you instantiate it. Uh, for sake, the one that we really care about is layers. And you'll notice that layers is an array, right? Uh, for, again, for simplicity, just so that you're not looking at this long uh, chain of code or this long chain of JSON, uh, I'm just do putting one uh, visualization layer into the overlay. But actually, you can do something like 37 or 38 before, it, before bad things start to happen. Uh, this, is, this is actually really cool because it allows you to create composite effects. So, that, so that's one, one reason to use it. Uh, you could take different visualizations, for example, and put them on top of each other to create combined effects. Uh, you can also, this is also a really useful tool for uh, performance as well. Because it turns out if you're, if you're pulling in like a million data points over HTTP, that's pretty slow. Uh, so you can actually chunk the data, right? And then, and then composite multiple layers on top of each other. Because right uh, for the user, it just looks flat. So walking through this, so oops, I am instantiating a scatter plot layer. This is the same as the one that we saw in the Paris map. Every layer in DeckGL needs an ID. This is for that. Uh, that this is for the reactive programming part of it. Uh, it doesn't apply to this particular uh, demo. I'll get to that later on. And then I give it a data source. So another cool thing is remember all the data sources I had up top were just. URIs that pointed to, to an API. There's actually a, a bunch of different ways that you can feed data into DeckGL. So you can give it like a local JSON blob or a CSV file, uh, or you can give it a URI. It recognizes it as a URI, and it, and it uh, orchestrates the HTTP request and the promise for you. Pretty nice, pretty nice convenience. Uh, there's also a whole set of different styling options. So whether or not the points are going to have opacity, are they stroked, what's the fill color, all of this, right? Uh, these min pixel, max, radius min pixel, radius max pixel settings handle that, uh, that dynamic resizing that I was talking about before, right? So this is saying, as I zoom in, this is the widest that the points can get. And as I zoom out, this is the smallest that they can get. So you have a lot of control. And this is just a very small set of the styling options that are available. Every layer has different, different options, and it's, it's pretty extensive. The next thing is this get position. So this is where we tell DeckGL in the, in the payload that comes back from, from this API, this is where you're going to look in order to get your lat long points. Because as you can imagine, right, the API doesn't just return an array of latitude and longitude points. It's got all kinds of stuff. Right, and all kinds of and all kinds of different properties in the JSON object. So I tell it. So what I tell it to do here, it accepts a function, and it basically runs a map. And it, it runs a map, not a not a Google map, like a map function, uh, that that walks each line of the payload, and then pulls the and then pulls the uh, latitude and longitude from the object. Make sense? Cool. So. And then also, there's a bunch of different properties that you can set dynamically. In this case, um, you know, I have this set up as a function, but I just am returning one color. But I could, for example, have a conditional statement in here and say, like, you know, if it's tree type X, then color Y, similar to what you saw in that Paris map. Right? And then the last part 
is I just call set map on the overlay and pass it the instance of the of the Google map. So this is what tells this is what tells uh, DeckGL this is the actual map instance of a map that I want you to attach that overlay view to, which so that the so that the overlay stays in sync, right, with our base map. Um, oh, I forgot to mention, if you have any questions during any of this, feel free to ask. I don't mind being interrupted at all. Uh, you don't even have to raise your hand. You can just ask. Cool. So let's go here. Oops. So I just have all these demos running on like a little Webpack server, Webpack dev server. Do not break the Wi-Fi. Great. Okay. So, so this is like 30,000 uh, data points that represent street trees in, in New York City, in Manhattan specifically. I promise we'll look at something other than trees tonight as well. <laughs> uh, and as you can see, right, you can zoom all the way down to the ground. So these are all individually rendered in the GPU uh, all into the canvas. And again, right, like you can tell something about a place. Uh, why, what do you think this area right here is in Manhattan? Industrial. It's, uh, it's uh, Times Square. Not a lot of trees growing in Times Square where all the big uh, movie signs and things are. Or down here in this area, that's Wall Street, right? So even something as simple as where are the trees actually paints a picture of a place for you. Let's look at another one. So the next one that we'll look at and I am going to save you the pain of watching me handwrite a bunch of boilerplate and use the miracle of copy and paste. <laughs> You're all Stack Overflow using developers. I know you copy and paste, don't lie. <laughs> <laughs> and just put a different layer type in. And I am an obsessive compulsive JavaScript developer, so I'm going to adjust my tabs. I'll change the map center, in this case, to Chicago as well as the zoom level. And so same, same deal, just a different layer type, arc layer. What arc layer is made for is to, visual, is to visualize the uh, connection between a de an origin and a destination point as a three-dimensional arc. So you may have seen visualizations before, right, where it's all of the flights coming out of an airport, for example. This is what this is for. Uh, again, it has a unique ID. You give it the data source. In this case, there's two dynamic places where I need to tell it where to pick up the latitude and longitude, because there's an origin and a destination point for every visualization. And then I have some coloring, and uh, like I set the width of the, of the uh, arcs. Uh, is this big enough for everyone in the back to see, by the way? We good? Oh, that's right. We have TVs everywhere. Sorry. <laughs> cool. Uh, and then I call set map. So let's save that and reload it. So this is uh, like 18,000 taxi cab rides in the city of Chicago. So like this is O'Hare Airport out here, and then you can see everything is coming into the city. Uh, pretty cool, but it's a little bit hard to tell actually what's going on when you have this much data, right? So it looks just kind of little like a big blob. Uh, but the reason why I show this is because the interesting thing is not when you look at it like this, it's when you look at it like this. So this is 18,000 arcs that are individually rendered in three-dimensional space, right? <laughs> Talk's over. That was the, that was the, the pinnacle right there. <laughs> uh, so and again, right, you can go all the way down to the ground, right? Pretty cool, yeah? Um, so I'll look at, oh yeah, what's up? So the map you showed. Uh -huh. uh, the map is a static layer that basically is rendered by Google Maps. Correct. And the overlay that is this, uh, the, these data points, this is a 3D space. Correct. Yep. Holy because it's rendered because it's rendered by the web by with WebGL yeah. in the GPU. So you can so you can do both two-dimensional and three-dimensional work with WebGL. All right. All right. Let's look at one more because I don't want to keep you that late. <laughs> Uh, so the last one that we'll take a look at is what's called a trips layer. So a, 
So sometimes, right, we don't want to just look at the static data on the map standing still, right? A lot of geodata has a time element to it, right? We want to see where things are moving relative in time. So trips layer is purpose built for this. So if you can imagine something like I have, I don't know, a fleet of delivery trucks, right? And I want to see in a 24 hour period where they were all going so that I can understand how they were visually, how they were moving relative to one another, right? This is what trips layer is for. Similar sort of thing, oops, similar sort of thing. Have my overlay, I import my trips layer and my styles. And I won't walk through all this other boilerplate code other than to say basically the way that I have this set up is I use our places API and I generate a set of 10 restaurants around the center point of the map, okay? So I have 10 points and then I, and then I feed those to our directions API and I, in order to create directions that, uh, that join each point to every other point. So I end up with a, a set of a, an array of 190 different sets of turn by turn directions. Make sense? That's math, right? 190, 10, yeah, 190. So this is just uh, this is just where I'm generating that places data. I'm using our I'm using our uh, nearby search feature in the in the places service in or, or the places yeah the places service in order to uh, get that places data, and then I'm generating the directions here uh, for just for ease of use. I have a little node server running in the background that does all the calculation for me and makes everything into like nice arrays. So the end data set for each trip ends up looking like an array that contains a whole set of, of uh, geocodes, of lat long points, right, that represent each turn by turn, all right? And then each of those, each of those points has a timestamp associated with it. So now we're able to pass this to, to the trips layer and it can understand what points it's connecting, and how much time it's supposed to take to get between those points, okay? <clears throat> Same deal, I load the script, I initialize the map. Uh, let's jump down here real quick. So yeah, load the script, initialize the map, get the places, generate all the trips. Uh, but this time you'll see that I'm instantiating Google Maps overlay, right? But I'm not giving it anything. It's just a blank overlay in this case. The difference, as well, is that now I call this render function that I have up above. In this render function, on that empty overlay, I call, I call this, mem this member function uh, set props. And what set props allows us to do is tell DeckGL, with, uh, is tell DeckGL to basically update its context. So if you have, for example, an overlay, and then based on, for example, user interaction, right, you want other layers to be inserted or destroyed, right? set props is how you do that. So I'm giving it a new set of layers. In this case, just one trips layer. It has an ID. There's the data, the path, right? So I'm dyna dynamically telling it where to look in the payload in order to get that stuff. Uh, some different, some different uh, effects or uh, uh, styling. And then the last thing to point out is this current time property. So current time tells deck, tells this particular layer in deck gl that for this render this is the timestamp in the series that i want you to animate towards right and then you can see that i'm incrementing current time by by one on every recursive render of the layer so i'm calling it recursively using request animation frame right now you might wonder every time i pass this layer back to back to deck gl it recognizes that it has rendered it previously. And so now it just does a shallow diff on the object. There's other ways if you have like sort of deeper changes to the data set or something, you can, you can tell it that. But by default, it does a shallow diff on this object. And so in this case, the only thing that's changing is current time. So it takes the data set it already knows that it's already rendered into the context and just advances the animation for us because the only thing that we're telling it is that time is advancing forward. Make sense? Cool. So let me just make sure I have my little node server running. And let's start this up. It takes a few seconds for the data on this one to load because I generate all the places and then I have to do all the calculations for to make that. This is what we get. Huh. 
the really cool thing about this is DeckGL, for every, for every time I tell it to advance, it's not just creating each frame for me. It's also animating three to four in between frames as well. So these animations run at 60 frames a second, which uh, if, if, if anyone is, is not familiar, 60 frames per second is the threshold at which the human eye can, uh, can interpolate jank. So they're nice and smooth. Uh, the last thing that I like to point out is you can do other cool things like let's change the color a little bit and I don't know, bump the, the trail length on these and reload it. And you get this. So I like to do that just, because, just to point out that you get a whole different sense of this visualization just by changing the styling on it. So this is kind of one of the, the really great things about all of that styling control that you have with DeckGL. <coughs> cool. All right. Um, I don't have time for one more, right? We should get out of here. What time are we on? It's uh, uh, almost 8.30. We've got time for one more if you're up for it. I can run one more. This is the one that's the most likely to break the Wi-Fi, so let's see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's why it's last. So uh, you know, one other thing that we often want to do with any kind of data, but particularly with geodata, is look at it in aggregate. OK? So yeah. Oh, sorry. Question? Wait. Oh, zoom out again? Like run it again? So, which one? This one? This one. Oh, yeah, OK. Hit record. Let's do it. <laughs> Ready? All right. <laughs> That's awesome. That's the only time I've gotten the, the whoa twice. <laughs> um, uh, actually, something I, that I always forget to mention is you can totally pull up the, that uh, goo.gle slash deckgl demos, and you can run this on your phone. Like any, any browser that has WebGL context, this will work in. All right, so we often want to look at things in aggregate, right? So. Um, what, what I'm going to show you now is what's called a hexagon layer. And again, miracle of copy and paste. Literally the greatest invention in computer science, copy and paste. And here we are. Let's add this in. Change the center point and the zoom, and reload it. And uh, while all this, this pulls down like 150,000 uh, data points. So I'll let it kind of load in the background for a second. Uh, so what hexagon layer does is it's basically a bar chart on top of the map. So we give it a data set of many, many latitude and longitude points. We give it the size of, uh, let's call them buckets, right? And what it will do is it will aggregate, it'll do a count of all of the points that fall inside of each bucket. And it'll visualize a three-dimensional uh, hexagon on top of the map so that you can see, you can visualize relative concentrations, essentially. Let's see if it loaded. Yeah, this one totally takes a minute. There we go. Cool. So uh, yeah, this, this represents like 150,000 active businesses in the city of Los Angeles. Uh, and again, pretty neat that you get like the whole parallax effect. And it performs really well. I saw a really cool demo actually where somebody did this and there's like an option where you can make the, uh, oh, I have it here. So see how you can like see down in the center of them? They made it so that you could zoom all the way down to the ground and then it would flip to street view. <laughs> that was pretty cool. Look up like Fireship Deck GL on YouTube and you can see that one, it's, it's really neat. Uh, and again, tells you something about a place, right? This big concentration here, it's downtown Los Angeles. Uh, another one that I, always, that I always think is really cool is you look, let's see, where is it? Oh yeah, there it is. Like over here, see this like ribbon? That's Ventura Boulevard, right? It tells you something about a place. Awesome. Uh, all right, so that's it. Again, these are the links if you want them. Uh, our docs are really cool. They're like, it's like the biggest doc set at Google. It's enormous. Uh, <laughs> 
This, this link goes to the specific place in the DECGL docs that talks about Google Maps Overlay, that particular class. Uh, and if anyone is interested in kind of the, the guts of how our, t our engineering team worked with the engineering team at Uber to get DECGL working with Google Maps, uh, because surprisingly complicated, all these things like you need cameras to sync and maps to stay in sync and all this, uh, that is all detailed in all of its glory in, and gory glory and gory detail uh, on the, Viz, the VizGL blog. Uh, oops. And the YouTube channel. We're super excited about this, so <laughs> please check that out. Uh, that's it. Thanks so much. Uh, that's my Twitter handle. Please, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. <laughs>